What would you say? Maybe you've had this scenario where someone said something that you know is not true biblically, but as you think through it, it's worded in such a crafty way that you don't know what to say to it. Uh, today's episode of the Truth and Love Show is for you. You're watching Truth and Love. Well, welcome to the Truth in Love show. Thank you so much for joining us. And Dennis Lewis, thank you so much for uh, joining us on the show today and, and giving us some feedback. Man, it's fantastic to be here. I can't wait to speak the truth in love. I want you to know today and today only, Dennis Lewis is a very stand-up guy. <laughs> that was so lame. So, if you've so watched you. any of our so other episodes, we've always done them sitting down. And today, I am pumped. We're standing up. This is this is too important. And what we're what we're going to do is take a look at some skeptical objections, questions, or maybe right. even some things that's like, man, I don't know what to say to that mm -hmm. and really kind of break down the truth. So I'm excited about this. I'm excited about that as well. Um, we're going to look at our first clip. It's from a guy. He kind of goes by the moniker, the friendly atheist. His name is Hemet. Uh, he's got about 200,000 followers. Just about. And he goes through a significant list That's of funny. questions he has for God. Let's take a look. You may have heard about a recent tragedy in Branson, Missouri, where 17 people died after the boat they were on for a special tour was caught in a storm, flipped over, and trapped people underneath. It was horrific. I mean, fewer than half of the people on the boat survived. One of the survivors was a 15-year-old girl, and as you can imagine, her mother, who wasn't on the boat, was so thankful to learn her daughter was alive. And she said something to reporters that sounds perfectly normal. She said she felt fortunate that God spared my child. God spared her child. <laughs> now look, I have no desire to criticize anyone whose emotions have been through hell and back, but I think this statement needs to be analyzed because it's such a common sentiment. You know, if God spared her child, the implication is that God chose not to spare the lives of any of those 17 other people. In this mother's mind, the same God who killed those people allowed her daughter to make it out alive, and she's praising him for it. Do you know what the other side of that tragedy looked like? Nine of the people who died were from the same family. Imagine what it must be like for the surviving members of that family to hear someone else thanking God for the decisions he supposedly made in that storm. Now look, obviously the mother wasn't intentionally trying to say something awful, but that doesn't mean it's not a completely warped way of thinking. If you're thanking God after a tragedy, then God deserves blame for the death and destruction too. Or hear me out here, maybe a better God would have stopped the storm from happening in the first place. Oh, wow. That is a troubling series of what seems to be punch after punch after punch. Wow. Now, you may be sitting there at home going through a variety of emotions. Mm. One, you may be sitting there so angry at what this guy is saying, or you may be sitting there going, I should abandon the faith. Oh, man, I've, I've, I've like all of this stuff is so convincing. I have nothing to say. Wherever you're, where, you know, wherever you're at, we have answers. So you're watching the right show. <laughs> but what are some of your initial impressions? of this this long series of, of clips here. well first of all Ben I would encourage our audience not to abandon the faith <laughs> number course, one course, and course. number two don't get angry as you said there are reasonable answers to each and every one of his questions but I think even more important is coming to this with a set of preconditions in your thinking in order for you to properly analyze these questions. So why don't you uh, present those to us? Yeah, well, I, first of all, 
most of what he said there is based on untrue presuppositions. Right. And uh, we want to break that down. But I did have, before we get into the details, and we're going to at least significantly break down that last thing he said about, about Jesus and everything and the mafia. Um, but five things we're thinking. One was to be open to challenging questions. Yeah. And we've made a list here. So we want to approach it with openness, not with anger, not with fear, but go, oh, that's a challenging question. I want to know what you have to say. Explore yeah. that a little more. One of the phrases I love to say is, what do you mean by that? So, but, but I'm comfortable knowing that I know the truth. The right. Bible's not changing. I have the truth. Now, I may not have the exact answer in this moment, but there are answers. And so I want to be open to challenging questions. Right. And then, then kind of with that is praise truth wherever we find it. So whatever piece of, of the pie that someone says is true, and there was very little, almost no truth that right. you could find common ground in what he said. Right. But sometimes people do say some things, start there, go like, well, here's what you said that I agree with, and this yeah. is true. But then this next one, remove untrue assumptions. You want to talk a little bit yeah, about that. Yeah, and that's so important because remember, when an atheist is talking about Christianity, they're coming from a perspective that's or a framework that cannot rightly analyze who God is and what God is saying. In fact, the Bible clearly says in 1 Corinthians 1 that natural man does not understand the things of God. They're, they're foolishness to him. And he's approaching it from that perspective. And it's like kind of walking in darkness. We use the term worldview. Yeah. So if you're not looking at the world correctly, you can't come to the right conclusions. Absolutely. And those are based on false assumptions. Um, uh, present a reasonable answer. So what does that mean, Dennis? Well, a reasonable answer simply means here is something that's logical, that you could present, that is credible, plausible, and you just present it as, hey, here are the facts as presented in God's Word, and this is something that if you are a reasonable person, you can look at and say, oh, okay, I could see where you're coming from there. And the Bible says, study to show thyself approved unto God. Right. Um, and I think that that encompasses more than just study of the Word. I think that includes study of the culture, study Absolutely. of evidence, study yeah. of these things. And if you go to the Center for Truth and Love, you can find videos, resources, things that will better equip you to be ready to give that reasonable answer. Mm -hmm. But last, be comfortable with rejection. Absolutely. And I think sometimes we have that engagement where people come to us and we've got to go, hey, I, they may not receive what I have to say, but I think we need to kind of define that word comfort. What, what do you, what, like contextualize that for yeah, us? Yeah, absolutely. Kind of. So when I think of comfortable with rejection, I don't think about we're okay with lost people not coming to the knowledge no. of the truth. Like we have a laissez-faire um, disposition towards that. I think what, what it means is that you can't take that rejection personally mm -hmm. as if somebody's rejecting you. Remember, we are just conduits of the gospel. We ourselves are not the gospel. And so I think that's where that word is so, and that mindset is so important. We're going to break down that final clip. He said, just let's, let's uh, watch just that little piece of it real fast. If you really wanted our sins to be forgiven, why did you have to kill your son to do it? That's like what the mafia would do. So first of all, I, I, I know I want to find common ground, but there's very little there. The, the mafia. Like, I've seen a few mafia movies, Dennis. Yeah. Like, they don't kill their own sons. They may kill the, the, someone else's son right, or the person's right. son down the road, right. but they don't kill their own son. So yeah. he has the mafia wrong, yeah. for sure. Absolutely. But that's not what we're here to talk no, about. No, that's not. Uh, that's an excellent analysis, but not what we're here to talk about. <laughs> hey, listen, let's apply three principles we talked about in our last episode. Yeah. First of all, let me say this. I appreciate the fact that he's asking questions. There are some people yeah. who come from the position, oh, this doesn't matter. Why am I spending time talking about this? Well, can I, can I pause there? Because sure, I ahead. don't consider some of what he said questions. And I think okay. it is important for us to discern between, and they certainly are questions yeah. and we want to preach. But sometimes people are asking questions, but they're not asking questions. I know, I they're know. They're saying yeah. things. But I do think sometimes people do ask legitimate questions. Right. And those people, like you got to discern between Absolutely. the two. And and I know, I know you know that, but yeah. I think that's good for us to just right. be reminded of. But keep right. going. I'm sorry. No, well, having said that, if he is asking a question, that's a good point. Is this an honest question that deserves an honest answer? Francis Schaeffer used to say that all the time. Honest questions deserve honest answers. So I'm going to assume the best of him yeah, let's and that. say he's asking an honest question. 
Let's give him an honest answer. He obviously has missed the part about the fact that we are dead in trespasses and sins, so yeah. there's a sin issue there. And as Anselm said in Cordeus Homo, it's a book uh, about why the God-man, why that Jesus Christ have to come and die for your sins, he doesn't understand sin. Of mm. course, God could have just said, yes, I forgive you, but sin is high treason against God. And sin, according to the Bible, mm. demands payment and someone um, dying in the place uh, for, to redeem mankind for those sins. So outside of that framework, of course, what uh, God did seems like cosmic child abuse, but it's not. It is not. Jesus Christ had to come in order to satisfy the wrath of God. And we don't understand sin, but also we don't understand concepts like justice right. or holiness, holiness in this, because God is holy. Right. He cannot look on sin, but what he did was, is he sacrificed his one and only son. And Jesus was the only person that could die for sin, mm -hmm. but being sinless, conquer sin and death Amen. and offer redemption to yeah. us. So it was like, yes, my only son's life had to be sacrificed. Right. However, yeah. he's the one person yeah. that can be victorious. Yeah. He is, we use the term in literature, the Jesus figure. He is the firstborn from the dead. Absolutely. He has the ability to conquer death. And so when we see the sacrifice, we go, wow, God, thank you. Yeah. And real quick, Ben, he willingly did it. Jesus did. He wanted to do it. Yeah, this wasn't, he wasn't being forced no. by the Father. No. He, he gave of himself. Yeah. An excellent thought. We're going to take a break, and when we come back, more breakdowns of more skeptical objections and questions. We'll see you in a little bit. Want more information about speaking the truth in love? Text the word PREPARED to 345345. We will send you a free resource that will equip you to speak the truth in love. Also consider our Truth in Love digital resource for your church, small group, or family. Learn from six lessons that include videos from panel experts and teaching from Ben Shetler, all shot on location in New York City. Download it today at thecenterfortruthinlove.org. Welcome back to the Truth and Love Show. Take a look at this clip from Richard Dawkins, possibly one of the most famous atheists in the world, that calls faith, your faith in God and the Bible, evil. Throw away, why throw around these sweeping statements about religion? Not the God of the Old Testament, but religion itself being evil. I mean, do you believe religion is evil? Mm, no. But you say plenty of times in this book that religion is evil. You said in a speech famously that I think a case can be made that faith is one of the world's great evils, comparable to the smallpox virus, virus but harder to eradicate. I do think that, yes. Uh, because um, what I'm talking about there is faith, where faith means belief in something without evidence. Because if you believe something without evidence, then that justifies anything. You, you're no longer vulnerable to somebody coming back at you and saying, hang on a minute, let me argue the case. If you believe it without evidence, which is what faith is, then you don't argue the case. You say, no, I'm not arguing that case. This is my faith. It's mine. It's private. I don't, dis I don't dissent from it. I don't retreat from it. You're just going to have to accept it. Now, that is evil. All right, I've just got to say, at the Truth and Love Show, we are really upping our game. Did you notice the quality black and white that we have provided? I mean, high-end, stylistic look. Well done. Uh, well, not only did that clip not had, have color, it lacked a lot of truth. Where do we start on this? What would we say to someone that's going, your faith is evil, your faith, right. uh, but what would we say to that? Well, listen, first of all, let's take a step back and realize this is what we've been saying, that Richard Dawkins is coming to this from a wrong assumption. Right. He's defining faith in a way that no Christian that I know of um, who understands the essence of the Christian faith would ever define faith. Um, faith in belief of something without evidence. So we call that a straw man argument. It's like right. you go over here and you build something and then you tear it down, right. but it's not what we believed. And right. so it sound, sounds really convincing, right. but Christians don't define faith that way. So no. how do we define faith? Well, Christians define faith as the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Listen, hope needs 
substance. It needs something to hope in. If I have cancer and somebody says, hey, I have a, a cure or a, a method in which I could cure your cancer, and then I say, great, when can I start? And they say, oh, no, I just told you that so you could have something to hope in so you could feel better. That's that not makes no sense. That's yeah, not that's... substantive at all because the thing didn't actually exist. And what our Bible tells us is that God does exist. He left behind his word. He left behind the Holy Spirit. He left behind the external natural world. We call it natural revelation. All of these things point to sub something substantive that we can hope for, even though we don't perceive it with our natural eyes. And I like the conclusion of that verse yeah. where it says the evidence of the unseen. So yeah. faith is that when I am exercising faith, it is demonstrating that I have a reasonable, according to the Bible, that right. I have a reasonable uh, prerequisite for believing in something. Absolutely. And in 1 Corinthians 15, the apostle Paul is speaking to the church and he says, oh, you don't believe Jesus rose from the dead? Here's a person to go talk to. Here's a person. Here's 500 that saw him at one time. Yeah. So that the faith I have is faith. I am trusting something that I cannot see. Right. However, it is based out of reasonableness. I think one of the best examples is my friend Ted. I don't have any kids. Right. But my friend Ted, his daughter Evelyn, will pretty much anywhere jump into his arms, even from high places. Yeah. Well, that's faith. She doesn't know her dad's gonna, gonna catch her, but because she presupposes based on past rationales, yeah. she can jump, she can have faith, and that's how Christians have faith. It's not unreasonable no, it's not. to have faith. Well, we've gotta march on, I'm sorry, I'm probably taking, I'll give you more time to talk, and then I, I just like talking. Uh, so we're gonna march on to this next clip. Um, take a look at this skeptical objection. Maybe the last question. And thank you very much for coming out. I completely agree with this guy. I've worked here for two and a half years, and I've never seen the room this full. Well, you know, me and Violet. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, we know how to draw a crowd, so. <laughs> so your last, my, la my argument against religion is sort of emotional, so it's not fair to ask you to respond to it. Go ahead. But no, I would like seriously. you to comment on it nonetheless, sure, because sure. I've heard it repeated amongst my colleagues yeah. several times. To me, it feels kind of arbitrary to choose between so many different religions. For example, I have no problem with the argument that there is a God or there isn't a yeah. God. I personally don't feel either way. I just kind of don't care about the question because it doesn't seem to affect me. Mm -hmm. And when people say there's a God, I don't have a problem with it. What I do have a problem with is when people say, oh, by the way, God wrote a book. And this book that he wrote, even though it contradicts with all the other books, is correct to the exclusion of all others. And I know that I've heard a lot of Christians say that, well, Christianity kind of has a leg up on the other religions because yeah. in this religion, God actually came down and told us that, you know, yeah, which he exists, I, right? I kind of well, alluded to at the end, yeah. Surprisingly enough, there is another religion where this is true as well. I'm actually God. Mm -hmm. And if you don't kneel down before me and worship me, you're going to go to hell. Mm -hmm. And also, my hell is actually worse than the Christian hell. Yeah. It's a lot worse. There's maggots right. and snakes and right. in-laws and everything. <laughs> so, and obviously you probably aren't gonna worship me, which is unfortunate because I kind of need the money, but why not? So once again, another troubling video, and do not be afraid. We will have even more troubling videos <laughs> after this one. Um, but what so would you, many troubling videos. <laughs> what would you say to that, Dennis? Well, a couple of things. Now, at the end of the day, what he's talking about is the issue of exclusivity. Why does Christianity um, present itself as being an exclusive religion? By that, I mean Jesus Christ making an exclusive claim I am the way, the truth, and the life. Because immediately what he tried to do was establish another religion parallel to the Christian religion that says the exact same thing. And the Bible helps us to understand how to navigate that by saying, listen, Christianity doesn't claim to possess all information. That's why other religions have kernels of truth to them. But what Christianity does lay claim to is Exclusive, uh, exclusive bits of information, namely that Jesus Christ came to the world to die for the sins of man and to present a clear and present way to the Father. 
that's the essential claim of Christianity. The resurrection proves um, that Christianity is true, the power of God, and the lives that have been um, saved and changed as a result of that evidences true Christian faith and belief. And I would go beyond because it's because I think we need to understand what's the root of this ex Absolutely. exclamation. And it's interesting. It's found in even in the way that he operates. Right. So he says, well, I've got another religion. And then all of a sudden it's all about him. him. I am God. I, and, and what's really interesting in that, that choice is how indicative that perspective is. He says, first of all, I don't really care if there's a God or not right. because it's irrelevant to me. Well, you don't understand if there is a God, you're responsible to that Absolutely. God. So it's very relevant to you. But then he, he makes himself his God. And I, I would say that in our culture, that's what we see is we see everyone culturally speaking, our culture sees everyone as individual gods right. and you don't step on someone else's goddom or kingdom or whatever. Everyone is individually God. And that's why he's like, well, I'm God. And I'm like, why can't you worship me? And as if, as if, well, we have no reason to worship you. What have you created? Right. What have you made? What, what, what gives you the right? And when you look at the message of the Bible, what you see is God has the right to rule his creation so because yeah. he is God. Right. And the devil wants to make us God. That's what he did from the very beginning. Right. Hey, what has God said? So uh, let's take a look at an, another troubling clip. Take a look. You may have heard about a recent tragedy in Branson, Missouri, where 17 people died after the boat they were on for a special tour was caught in a storm, flipped over, and trapped people underneath. It was horrific. I mean, fewer than half of the people on the boat survived. One of the survivors was a 15-year-old girl, and as you can imagine, her mother, who wasn't on the boat, was so thankful to learn her daughter was alive. And she said something to reporters that sounds perfectly normal. She said she felt fortunate that God spared my child. God spared her child. <laughs> Now look, I have no desire to criticize anyone whose emotions have been through hell and back, but I think this statement needs to be analyzed because it's such a common sentiment. You know, if God spared her child, the implication is that God chose not to spare the lives of any of those 17 other people. In this mother's mind, the same God who killed those people allowed her daughter to make it out alive, and she's praising him for it. Do you know what the other side of that tragedy looked like? Nine of the people who died were from the same family. Imagine what it must be like for the surviving members of that family to hear someone else thanking God for the decisions he supposedly made in that storm. Now look, obviously the mother wasn't intentionally trying to say something awful, but that doesn't mean it's not a completely warped way of thinking. If you're thanking God after a tragedy, then God deserves blame for the death and destruction too. Or, hear me out here, maybe a better God would have stopped the storm from happening in the first place. Or better yet, blame someone who actually deserves it, like the captain who didn't make everyone wear life jackets. As someone else once said, thanking God for sparing you in a disaster is like sending a thank you note to the serial killer for stabbing the family next door. So we're finding that the friendly atheist may be kind of like somewhat friendly <laughs> in his demeanor, but not really in what he says. Um, I mean, like, wow, what a way to emotionally manipulate a tragedy to uphold your worldview. It's right. kind of disappointing. Um, but what do we what do we say to this? I mean, can we thank God? I mean, like I do want to answer the question because I think right. it's a question that's raised in our culture. It's an unfortunate question mm -hmm. in many ways because it it misrepresents a correct view of God. But what do we say to this, Dennis? Yeah, Jesus addressed this question I think beautifully in the book of Luke when he's asked about a tragic event that happened: the Tower of Shalom falling on mm, a group yeah, of people, yeah. or Caesar uh, mingling the blood of of those that had died. And he said, do you suppose that you are right, more righteous than them because they um, died and you were spared? Mm. No, except you all repent, you should likewise perish. 
What Jesus was saying that was so profound and something we need to keep in the back of our minds during any time there's a tragedy is this. Um, the reason why we have tragedy is because of sin. All of us deserve to die. That's, that's the just punishment. He's assuming that all of us are good, that all of us deserve life. But Jesus reminds us none of us deserve life. All of us deserve death because of sin. Yet God in his mercy yeah. spares those. Now that's a difficult concept for people to realize because everyone deep down is a humanist, right? We believe that man is the measure of all things. We believe that man is basically good. But listen, I have children and I've been a pastor long enough to know that none of us is basically good. Plus even more so the Bible says there is none good, no, not one. We've all sinned and the wages for those sin is death. And so it is good and right and proper for us to praise God when he spares life. Now, the question of can God save everyone? Absolutely he can, but that's not the question at root. I like to think of it this way. If, if you have evil coming for you, right. and all of you have a number, hmm. uh, that, that's, that's the way I view it. So it's like evil is coming at us. Well, why is evil coming at us? Because we brought it towards ourselves. Yeah. We go all the way back to the garden and then each one of us have sinned. So, so the consequences of evil are coming at us. And so any time that we are spared, we praise God for that. Absolutely. And uh, so we can thank God. This whole question is based out from a misunderstanding of the consequences of sin. And this is, this is, I guess, in some ways you could say the beauty of atheism, but it's untrue. Is it's like, wow, we've found a crafty way to get around right. sin, but sin is a very yeah, right. real and consequential um, Sin is a issue. problem for the atheist too. Even though they don't want to think about it, they don't have a proper way of defining that. Yeah, it's a challenge. So uh, as we look at this, how would I give an answer? What would I say? I would say, well, as we're fallen, we certainly can thank God right. that we have not experienced tragedy and we have experienced his blessing in an incredible way. As we close out uh, this episode of what would you say, I, I'd like us to consider that we've mentioned several times in this episode, there are consequences for sin. But I'd like us to consider that there is a solution to sin because of the work of Jesus Christ. Yeah. And I am so thankful that God, even though we are responsible for our sin, God said, I'm going to make a way because you can't pay for your own sin. Yeah. And through his son, Jesus, who died on a cross, who rose again, uh, we can accept him. This is what Jesus told Nicodemus. Um, Whoever believes on me can have everlasting life. And I want to challenge you today. If you've never received Jesus as your personal Savior, would you accept him? If you have accepted Jesus, would you have the boldness and the courage to study the truth and to speak that truth in love? Thanks for watching. For more truth about current topics, follow Ben Shetler on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram. Visit the centerfortruthandlove.org where you can download resources to equip your family, learn through our curious conversation videos, or even book Ben Shetler to speak at your church or upcoming event. Our ministry is supported by the generous giving of people like you. Please consider giving a monthly or one-time tax-deductible gift at the centerfortruthandlove.org forward slash give.